Good morning, Atlanta. Great to have you here. Uh, Oliver Atzisberger, as Katie said, uh, I head up R&D at Teradata. Uh, my teams are responsible for all the products that are being developed at Teradata. Uh, and I'm very excited to take you through some of today's announcements and uh, how we map, map our strategy into the future of data and analytics. Let's first talk about digitalization. Digitalization is a key topic for a lot of executives around the world. In fact, a lot of C-level executives that we talk to call that out as their number one or one of their top three goals going forward. It's bringing together digital elements, data, sensor data, customer data, production data to transform entire industries. Digitalization is not easy. It's something that takes most companies years, but it empowers entire new business models, and we're going to talk about some of them here. I just recently met with a CIO of one of the uh, leading German car manufacturers, and the conversation was quite interesting. He said, you know, 10 years ago, IT was easy. Uh, we had internal systems, we had some firewalls, some web pages. Actually, we had limited customer data because it turns out our dealers had the customer data. We, the manufacturer, didn't. Now, fast forward to today. Cars are connected vehicles now. Every vehicle is a connected, internet-connected device. The firewall is no longer around our internal systems. We need to think firewalls of every single connected car. The data that we get is sensor data. We know how the vehicles behave. We know how customers use our products. It allows us to think about entire new business models. How about we offer performance on demand? What if we could give our customers a choice to say, oh, you're going on vacation? How about an extra 40 horsepower for the next two weeks so you can go on the Autobahn a little faster? Or how about we understand how the customers interact with our vehicles? Because they buy all these features, and there's GPS, and there's music, and everything is built in. But do they really use it? And if they don't use it, how can we help them to identify the features that they haven't used in a car and familiarize them with it? We have the digital displays. We have the data. Entire new business models. Digitalization is really causing a cultural transformation in companies. And technology is important. But if you cannot manage the people, the process changes, the cultural changes, it's not going to happen. The leading companies embrace digitalizations. Those that don't fall behind. It's, it's, it's difficult to embrace change. Um, many of you have had change in your lives. And change sometimes feels awkward. I remember. More than 10 years ago, uh, when I moved from Southern California up to the Bay Area, joining eBay, one of our big customers, and I've been a customer for many years, uh, that change was fundamental and different. We just bought a house. We had to pack everything up. We had to move into a new city. It's unknown. You don't know what is happening. Turns out it was one of the best moments in life. I wouldn't be here today if I didn't make that change uh, in 2004. So is the move to digitalization. It's difficult. It feels like you want to block it. You don't want to do it. It's new. We don't know what it is. Transformation is happening. It has to happen in the business. And we have to lead it with business outcomes and ultimately enable it with technology. That change management is super important. But as I said, change management is not just about technology. In fact, technology is the easy part. When you look at examples out there, there's different aspects of digitalization happening in different industries. We improve customer experiences. We look at financial transformation, product innovation, risk mitigation, supply chain intelligence, asset optimization. I could go on for, uh, forever. Digitalization allows new things to happen. Digitalization is also becoming the most important advantage for analytical competitors out there. And you need to build insights from the data 
to build a better future. And let's look at a couple examples here. First, let's look at um, an interesting healthcare example. Uh, many of you have hopefully heard about uh, 23andMe, a website, a service that allows you to map your genome. You order a little online kit, you get it. Uh, they have mapped 32 uh, genes that um, predict uh, depression in human beings. Financial institutions t use data to predict defaults on mortgages or credit cards. Energy companies with their connected meters are monitoring the connected grid and the load and how to improve that. Railways are becoming transportation companies that predict maintenance, that predict availability, that target 99% arrival time. It's quite different what it was a few years ago. And what does that do to us? How does it help us make a better future with our products? Well, in healthcare, the example that I just gave you allows you to develop better treatments. If we can predict what you are most likely uh, going to happen in, in your health, we can uh, uh, develop better treatment options. In financial services, we can create better financial stability. We can help people with their financial stability based on their customer journey with us. On the energy side, uh, those connected grids, those smart meters allow us to really effectively reduce carbon footprint, increase efficiencies, and the, the, limits, uh, the, the, the possibilities are limitless. And in transportation, uh, travel experiences for customers are changing. Transportation companies are no longer just selling trains. They are selling transportation. How about you can transport 10 million customers with an on-time arrival rate of greater than 99%? And oh, by the way, if you're late more than 15 minutes, well, here's your ticket back. Digitalization allows for entire new business models. But finding those insights is not really easy. In fact, if you look into your own company, most companies live in a world of data anarchy. We have silos of data. We have data spread all over the place. We do agile things that turn out to be wild, wild west. We go fast and forget about important things. That data anarchy makes it very difficult for us to extract the insights that we need to build that better future. As I said, we are dealing with silos. We have bottlenecks. It takes far too long to action, even if we find insight. We have things like data drift, where the same data shows up in multiple locations, and it's different. How many of you have been in, in meetings all the way up to board meetings and have heard two different departments quoting completely different results. I've been there when the CMO and the CFO argued about how many active customers we had last quarter. Was it five million or was it nine million? Right? Difficult. It's difficult to, uh, uh, to work with that. And because of that, we are spending as much as 80% of our time justifying the data and the results or looking for the needle in the haystack. We use humans to direct analytics. Out of these millions and billions of data points, we have dozens, maybe even hundreds, maybe thousands of analysts that we send against all of this data and say, go find insight. Really difficult. It's nearly impossible to see the signal in all of that data. And the more we digitize, the more sensor data comes to us, the more difficult it gets. And so, as we look at this, our brain is actually good in taking in data and extracting pattern and assigning meaning. When we touch a hot surface, we immediately uh, pull back. We are fast in learning. A human being thinks, learns through information. Um, and to give you a personal example, um, 
uh, oh, more than 20 years ago, uh, during my military service, I did my PADI open water certification. For those of, for those of you that have been diving, uh, uh, you know what PADI stands for. Uh, it's, it's, it's your degree that allows you to basically dive around the world. Uh, unfortunately, I had to do the certification in March of that year back in Austria. And when you go into a lake in Austria that time of the year, water is kind of fresh, maybe cold is the better temperature. In fact, when you go down 30 feet where you have to do your certification, the water temperature was four degrees Celsius. That's about, what, 38 degrees Fahrenheit? And they make you take a, a couple deep breaths, and then it's like, mask off. And so off goes the mask, and you pull it off, and you have to continue to breathe. And on comes almost freezing cold water to your face, right? And you automatically stop breathing, and you automatically want to shut down because it's like so freaking cold. And you have to really force yourself to breathe through that, put the mask back on. And luckily, I did it all right. I'm still here. I made the certification, but it was interesting. Point here is we react as human beings to our surroundings. The problem is we as companies don't do that quite well. Uh, World-class digitalization strategies need to be able to take in signals, assign a meaning to that signal, and act sometimes in milliseconds. We cannot wait until next week. Uh, and this is really important. Um, we need data analytics engines that help us do that. And we need to work much more like the human brain. Time is of the essence. To give an example, in 2015, Global mobile traffic grew by 74%. And by the way, it will increase by 8x by 2020. This is just more and more data, right? We cannot just have human beings look at that data in order to be lucky and find signal. We need systems uh, that help us with that challenge. Um, for that challenge to be successful, company needs to develop data and analytics roadmaps. And we ourselves have a definition of a North Star, uh, and we call that the sentient enterprise. And it's what we aspire to be, what we want our customers to, to get to, and it's all about based on analytics. With that, I want to do a little experiment here. I would like all of you to take out your mobile devices, go back into that partners app uh, that Katie took you through, and. Uh, I want you to go into the app, go to uh, Agenda Overview and Sessions, tap on the session icon, uh, go to General Session, and tap on the live poll. And here's a couple questions that we want uh, you to answer. Or the question is, uh, which of the following business outcomes will have the highest priority within your organization? Customer experience, risk mitigation, product innovation, financial transformation, asset optimization, or supply chain intelligence. Uh, take your time entering your answers. We will come back to the results in a couple minutes from here. We'll give you the time, think about that, uh, and we'll close out the session with the results of that little experiment. But gathering data is not enough. Yes, data changes everything, if you turn data into insights, if you apply analytics to that data, if you have a strategy that acts on these insights. And so a lot of companies really are looking, and the leaders are looking for high impact outcomes that benefit the bottom line. This is really important. It's not about science experiments. It is about what changes the business. You need to optimize your analytical ecosystem. Oh my God, do we have many choices today. Open source, commercial software, cloud, on-premise, structured data, unstructured data, Avro, JSON, limitless choices, and you can go into 100 different directions. It is so important to come up with a optimized analytical ecosystem that is built to support that business outcome. And ultimately, what that needs is you need technologies that give you the flexibility and the agility to run your organization at scale. And this is really important. And so this is how Teradata's strategy maps against these goals. 
We are focusing on business solutions. As Vic told us before, it's the business outcome uh, that, uh, that, 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 uh, that really means something to companies. Business solutions are our focus on business outcome, helping companies get faster there. The second pillar of our strategy is architecture expertise, helping companies technology independently come up with the right architecture to allow you to implement these business income outcomes. And this is where our expertise can help you with open source software, with technologies, with cloud, with on-premises to build the right ar architectural expertise. And finally, technology solutions. This is where Teradata, this is where we put our engineering to work for you and build products that enable your companies uh, transform the technology in, inside of your companies. So, with that, let's look at these three pillars uh, that, we, uh, that we're going to talk about. And with these pillars, we actually represent a pyramid that has equal strength sizes of business, technologies, and architecture. In fact, they need to be equally strong. And we built a 20-foot tall pyramid uh, in the Expo Hall over the last uh, a few days here to put this into perspective, to apply that thinking into a physical structure that you all can visit and interact with to see how business, architecture, and technology support each other and help you build a future, enable the transformation in the company. I hope you all will check out that um, pyramid. And by the way, we made it a little fun in there. You can go in there. You can take a picture of yourself and email and tweet and Facebook it uh, and put yourself in front of one of the great pyramids. In fact, here's an example. The Great Pyramids got that really right. The Great Pyramids of Giza have sites that are almost exactly 756 feet long, plus minus a few inches. They were built over 4,600 years ago, and it took them almost 20 years to build them. Amazing, amazing accomplishment. Not all pyramids ended up like that. In fact, uh, the famous Bent Pyramid of Dajur, just 40 kilometers south of Cairo, got started a little bit too steep. And as they realized that this wouldn't work out, they had to change the angle while building it. And well, it came out a little tilted. Our Expo Hall Pyramid is really there to get you thinking of how do you interact with the different aspects of your, uh, of your business and how business solutions, architectural exp uh, uh, expertise, and technology solutions come together. As I said, we have three core areas uh, that are coming together, but we wanted to reflect a fourth side here, which is equally important to us, which is the, our customers, you that are sitting here in this room and around the world. Please visit the pyramid, take a photo, share it, and so today, I'm going to focus on two of these sides of the pyramid. We're going to focus on technology solutions and architectural expertise. And on Wednesday, in the closing session, we will focus on the business solutions of Teradata. So let's take a look at technology solutions and our best of breed technologies that allow you to build analytical ecosystems in a hybrid cloud architecture. We want to give you the flexibility to deploy our technologies in, in, a, uh, in, 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 a, in a variety of deployment methods. Uh, and let's talk about this. Uh, we just announced today Teradata Everywhere. Teradata Everywhere is an industry first. It's the full scale-out version of the exact same Teradata database on-premises, in managed cloud, in public cloud and in private cloud, all available to you. You choose where you want to deploy that. We're making it easy to migrate workloads between these environments. We want you to achieve the right level of performance. Therefore, scale out is important. And we want the, the platforms to adapt 
and optimize themselves dynamically to the underlying platforms and to the queries that you operate on them. Teradata Everywhere is really made up of four quadrants. Uh, let's start with the first one, on-premises. Uh, we announced IntelliFlex earlier this year. I'll talk about it in a few minutes here. There's some news coming about IntelliFlex. We constantly are innovating and coming out with new features. But IntelliFlex is the backbone of our on-premises solution. Managed Cloud. As we announced earlier this year, we are expanding our managed cloud from our operations in the United States and now available in Germany, in Europe, uh, for European customers. The very big announcement, however, for this week is really our availability of the Teradata database on Amazon Web Services. As of this week, you can go into the Amazon Web Services marketplace, select Teradata, and install up to 32 nodes of a Teradata system in the Amazon Cloud. Click, buy, launch within minutes. If you have business problems that you want to ex uh, uh, experiment with, it's a great opportunity to do that. Uh, and I'm going to give you some examples of what we are enabling uh, with that. Coming soon, we will also have the scale-out version of the Teradata database on Microsoft Azure coming in Q4 of this year. On the private cloud, we also are now available with Teradata database on VMware. In fact, one of the world's leading telecommunications providers has been working for, uh, with us for the last one and a half years to alpha and beta test our private cloud capabilities, installing our Teradata software on their own hardware managed through a VMware environment. And they have their first applications in production up and running. There's three more production systems going live within the next two months uh, at that company running in their private cloud. Now, I want to go to a uh, little test that we're going to do here that we're going to sh show you how real all of that is. And we're going to run Teradata in a couple different environments. And uh, we're going to kick this off here in a second. I just want to leave you with what we're doing here. We put Teradata scale out uh, software on a couple different environments, 16 nodes, 24 terabytes of data. Uh, we're going to run it in a pre-release. Uh, on Azure, we have the production release that we have on uh, Amazon Web Services. We also have our managed cloud on there. And we show you how a competing other database uh, in the cloud is performing against that. The idea is we're going to let that run throughout the whole conference. And you can see how real all of that engineering has become that we have done over the last couple of years. Um, I wanted to kick this off myself, but Katie got so excited about that. She wanted to help us with that. And um, let's go to Katie. She's in the bus lounge. She will help us take a, a kick off this experiment. Hello, my friend. Well, first things first, we're going to get to some action right behind me. But why the name Teradata Everywhere? Well, Katie, in the cloud, boundaries no longer are factors. Teradata can be everywhere. Understood. Short and sweet. I like your style. All right, count this down because we got a demo happening right here. Okay. Go ahead and count it down, Oliver. Let's start this. Five, four, three, two, one, go. And it's happening. That was intense. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, you can actually come on over here to the Buzz Lounge and check out the running live benchmark for yourself. In the interim, Oliver, I'm throwing it back over to you. Thank you so much, Katie. This is going to be exciting. Uh, you will see how Teradata can run on different uh, environments. And by the way, uh, you will see that Teradata scales extremely well on these environments just like it would do on premises. Uh, and by the time we're over with the session, check it out. You will see some interesting results there. It always takes a couple of seconds uh, to kick this off and for the numbers to normalize. But with that, the other part of Teradata Everywhere is really um, 
two more big callouts that I want to make here. One is the Teradata database maps architecture. It is our next generation architecture that is going to be available in the first half of next year. 90% uh, reduction in downtime elasticity to our systems, really bringing elasticity into the cloud, enabling the ability to add resources, remove resources, and scale a, 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 a database in the cloud. Expand and shrink in the cloud, but also coming to your data center, coming to all those de deployment options. Uh, I also want to talk about the Teradata Database Adaptive Optimizer that's also coming out in the first half of the year, which is our next generation optimizer. Teradata has always been known to have the gold standard of optimizers. The new Adaptive Optimizer does in-stream query replanning. If the optimizer realizes that the plan was less than optimal, it will replan while it is running. It adapts to technologies, to these underlying platforms, and the host technologies that we are running on. And finally, I want to talk about quickly about IntelliFlex here. As I said, we've uh, released IntelliFlex in Q2. We have started shipping systems around the world in Q3. Uh, we're just going live with a 32-node system at an Australian bank. There's multiple systems going out in production in various locations around the world. And we have not, uh, not waited for that. We have already started to improve and, and come out with more features. In Q4, you will see additional features like we are doubling the memory. We can now go up to a terabyte of memory per node. We are also doubling the density with all SSD configurations. I really encourage you to visit the Expo Hall and check out the IntelliFlex system that is there. It's a 14 plus one system with all SSD in a single cabinet. The highest density Teradata platform we have ever built. The last thing that we're announcing with Teradata Everywhere is Astra Analytics. Astra Analytics is going places. We are taking Astra out of the box. Astra is now available in the Hadoop ecosystem. You can install Astra in your existing data lakes, in your existing uh, uh, Hadoop deployments, whether it's Cloudera or Hortonworks, whether it's 10 node or 1,000 node Hadoop clusters. Astra can be installed as a native application, runs within Yarn, stores its data within HDFS, and can access all the data that sits uh, within the data lake. Also available at the same time now, Astra Analytics on Amazon Web Services. That really brings all of our technologies, again, to all the on-premises, as well as to the cloud options that we've laid out. With that, I'm very proud uh, to welcome Dave McCann, Vice President, Amazon Web Services, Marketplace, and Catalog Services uh, to join me here on stage. Hey, Dave, how are you doing? Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Oliver. Good morning. It's a real privilege to be here, and uh, thank you, Oliver, for the invitation to talk to this audience and, indeed, the people that we are streaming online. Um, and welcome to the cloud. Cloud, Amazon Web Services believes that cloud is the new normal. Cloud is introducing disruptive change. It's changing the economics of compute, network, and storage. And today, cloud is bringing Teradata database and Astra Analytics to you in a new way that allows you to innovate and innovate very quickly. Amazon Web Services is growing at a very fast rate and it's indicative of customer adoption. We have over a million customers on the Amazon Web Services Cloud in 190 countries, enterprises of every industry in the world, and they're deploying compute storage network at a set of 77 Amazon Web Services. But on top of those Amazon Web Services, they're deploying best-in-class software. My role in AWS Marketplace is to make available to you as a Teradata customer all the software that you need for your business, and that includes Teradata. And today, Teradata becomes immediately available on 10 Amazon Web Services regions. That means that right now, Aster Analytics and Terabase, Teradata Database is now available in places like Frankfurt, Dublin, three regions in the US, Tokyo, Sydney, Korea, and India. Immediately deployable in those regions, it joins a library of over 1,000 software companies 
and 3,000 software titles, and we change how you procure. So part of the change of cloud is speed, and part of that is how we enable you to select, find, and deploy that software. So if you now click through to Marketplace this morning, which is a commerce facility, you're going to find prepackaged, ready-to-go Teradata software in a CloudFormation JSON script that will deploy in a very short space of time onto a set of resources that you choose to apply that to. Further, it's integrated into your Amazon billing system such that the cost and subscription of that resource is instantly available on your Amazon bill and can be tracked back. And as an indication of the kind of use that we're seeing in the marketplace, we published a metric of compute hours of software deployed out of marketplace. Two years ago, that compute hour of usage was 70 million compute hours per month of software deployed out of marketplace. Today, that number is over 205 million compute hours per month. And it's growing at 10 million compute hours per month plus. And so Teradata's software is wrapped in that CloudFormation model and is now immediately available for you to innovate with new projects and to move workloads over to the cloud. So as you do that and as you go to this marketplace facility, Oliver's team and our team are essentially giving you a way to have very fast choice, immediate availability on a set of resources on a global basis. So it is both speed, it's a new cost model, and it's a new innovation model. And Oliver, thank you for doing that. Thank you, Dave. So, so I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, as you know, of course, we have put the Teradata database and Aston Analytics into Amazon uh, uh, marketplaces. Uh, what do you think about Teradata making its software available in the, in the cloud? Well, first of all, I think it's a great win for your customer. It's an indication of you adapting to the change of cloud, and you're giving customers choice. And frankly, our customers and your customers are very often the same customer, and therefore we're really giving the customer the best choice across both sets of resources. Yeah. Uh, by the way, congratulations. This year marks the 10th year anniversary of Amazon Web Services. Uh, can you comment on the increasing comfort of enterprises putting data and processing into a cloud. I'd love to talk about that. You know, with the million customers that we have building on Amazon Web Services, um, the journey to the cloud involves very many different workloads. And large enterprises around the world journey into AWS, starting with things like websites, test dev environments, but then very much moving into bringing data, analytics, back office applications, SAP implementations, and really the entire workload of the enterprise. And we have large enterprises like Tokyo Stock Exchange, GE, uh, Siemens Healthcare, uh, News Corporation. Every industry is using the power of the cloud and they're bringing their workloads. And therefore your customers and our customers have data both on premise and in the cloud. Yeah, that's great, I think. Um, our two teams have been working together for about a year now. And what does this alliance between our two companies mean to you uh, on the AWS side? Well, first of all, you've been a great partner, and we really want to thank you for the effort. There's been learning on both sides. So our engineering team started working together over a year ago and continue to do so every day. And what that really means is we're learning more about the Teradata architecture and our team in Marketplace and our partner organization, essentially we provide on the AWS side expertise. And then we share that knowledge with Teradata and Teradata has brought up to skill a number of people such that together we're optimizing the Teradata experience. We call this well architected on. And the idea is that your software is architected to run well on our fabric. Uh, talking about uh, education and experience, a little data point I want to leave you with is, uh, as of last week, 97% of engineers at Teradata and almost 2,000 people at Teradata uh, in, in general are accredited and certified AWS uh, experts. And so, very proud, our, we are really committed to AWS and to the cloud, and I hope that shows to all of you how serious we are taking the cloud. 
That's a, a very impressive number. It's a great learning exercise. And look, we're going to continue to learn together as customers now deploy the software. And for customers in the room who are interested in how this would work, there is a follow-on talk this afternoon in C206 at 2 p.m. And for those of you who are interested, we encourage you to come along. There will be a joint AWS and Teradata conversation on how this will actually be deployed. Great. Dave, thank you so much. Thank you. We did a little study with our customers, with you, and we asked you, how do you think about hybrid cloud? And here's some interesting data points. 90% of our customers believe that they will be on some form of hybrid cloud by 2020. You are telling us that as much as 40% of your workloads will be running in the cloud by 2020. And 85% of you tell us that you actually want to buy capabilities as a service, not worrying about DBAs, not worrying about how many nodes or instances of something it takes. You want to build a, a, a consume services from us that are really integrating these capabilities. The next announcement I want to talk about that went out today, uh, we call Borderless Analytics. And it builds on Teradata everywhere. It is capabilities that now allow you to take these deployment choices and really build new use cases with that. It's still technology solutions, but here we are talking about three example use cases, cloud bursting, cloud data labs, and cloud disaster recovery. What we are doing is we have built two more uh, 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 software layers and we have evolved Query Grid to the next generation of its uh, implementation. And available in Q4 is Query Grid 2.0, which is now a common connector model. It's a service model that allows us to connect systems on premises in a managed cloud, in the public cloud, in a, in a private cloud through connectors. And not just Teradata, and not just Astro Analytics, also Hadoop, Presto various different forms of uh, 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 systems. And because it's now a connector-based system, we will build additional connectors going forward. There's now a new Query Grid API that ultimately next year we will uh, uh, um, release an SDK where other companies can build their own connectors into this. We have added security, encryption, and performance monitoring into Query Grid. You can now take a step back and watch how workloads span multiple systems on premises and in the cloud, and how queries reach through to other systems to perform uh, their operations, how workload management can be applied to that, and how security profiles are important to implement with that. Teradata Query Grid 2.0 coming in Q4. The second part of borderless analytics is really around uh, Teradata Unity. Teradata Unity has been in the making for years. It is really our ability, our service layer, to enable multi-active systems. And originally built for two or more on-premises systems, it is now going into the cloud. It has, allows us to combine on-premises, private and managed cloud and public cloud systems, and balance workload between the different instances. In addition to that, Coming soon, in the first half of 2017, we are releasing intelligence change data replication that allows you to make changes to an on-premise system and replicate the changes into the various forms of the cloud or vice versa. Also coming in the first half of 2017 is push-button system initialization. What that means is, let me create a new Teradata system in the Amazon cloud let me decide what applications I want initialized there, and the system by itself, Unity, will bring over all the data that these applications need, will sync them up to the system of record that you have, and then start running queries there as soon as the data transfers have prog progressed far enough. Really important capabilities that build and extend our Teradata analytical ecosystem. Uh, with that, I would like to welcome Todd Sylvester, Vice President of Product Management at Teradata, and he will show us a little bit what we can do with these capabilities. Hi, Todd. Hey, thanks, Oliver. 
As data warehousing becomes more and more mission critical and diverse, companies need the flexibility and choice to add systems as needed, whether it's active-active workloads or spinning up test and dev environments. And they need to do this in a self-service manner. And at the risk of using an overused term, apparently, they need to be used while being agile for the business. Right? But agile is not the Wild West, and we need to deliver agility without data anarchy. As Oliver mentioned, with borderless analytics and Terra data everywhere, we are able to meet these needs by providing multiple deployment options. Companies now have the choice of running Terra data on-prem with our next generation IntelliFix platform, within the public cloud domain, your own private clouds, as well as Terra data managed cloud. And that is the foundation of Terra data's vision of hybrid cloud. What I'm gonna walk you through today is two scenarios of the hybrid cloud. One around shifting or bursting a workload to the cloud, and the second one is empowering users to create a data lab within the cloud arena. Here you see a dashboard that we're going to be using our system monitor to manage and monitor our e analytic ecosystem. And this is a custom dashboard built on our covalent UI platform that we just recently open sourced. Like many companies, we have multiple systems environment, one's on-prem, and one's in the Teradata Managed Cloud. And we have a division of workload on both systems. We are, what we want to do is take advantage of the available cycles that's available in the, in the Managed Cloud, and we're going to drag and drop the finance application from the on-prem to the Managed Cloud environment. And what this is going to do, it's going to trigger an ecosystem manager workflow behind the scenes. And this will be rerouting the rules for the applications to move from the finance, the users, to the managed cloud. The key here is that this is transparent to the users and the application. Queries running that are in flight will complete on the on-prem system, and new queries and new workload will be moved to the environment. Now you're looking at a Unity dashboard that's actually rerouting the users behind the scenes. So you'll notice that the active sessions on the IntelliFlex will drop, and the active user sessions will increase around on the managed cloud environment. This is all about minimizing the IT efforts to manage a multi-system environment while delivering the SLAs for the business. So now as back to our system dashboard, you'll see that these systems are both in balanced state, and we've just dynamically moved a workload from one system to another. The key here is that all the capabilities I'm describing today are available to the products that we have in our portfolio currently. The second scenario that I want to walk you through is around empowering users to explore their data as dig in for insights without the IT assistance. Right? This is creating cloud data labs within this environment. So you notice from this environment where we have, a, uh, we have an on-prem system, we have a managed cloud, and by clicking the add sign in the bottom right hand side, we have a choice now of creating a data labs environment in three different scenarios. What we want to, we're going to do now is actually create a new Teradata instance in the Amazon Web Services and pre-populate that with our data labs environment with the necessary query grid connectors and the access privileges for the data lab. So again, this kicks off an ecosystem manager workflow and where we're going to, once the AWS instance is created, we're gonna add it to our Unity cluster, we configure the query grid connectors, we move the reference data over to the data lab. We check the access privileges on a data lab, and automatically we no notify the user that the data lab environment is open. This is automating a once very manual process. And then finally, as we move back to our uh, dashboard, you'll see three active Terry data systems running in the environment, and now we have three active user sessions on our Terry data instance in the Amazon Web Services Cloud. This is agility without data anarchy. A hybrid cloud environment leveraging Teradata everywhere to deliver a borderless analytic ecosystem. And with that, I'd like to invite you to the hybrid cloud booth on our expo floor to get a behind the scenes look by the development team that put this demo together. Thank you. Todd, thank you very much. Great presentation. Up until now, we have been talking about technology solutions. As we said, 
building the right architecture expertise, uh, expertise is really important. You cannot build a digitalization strategy without uh, or with technology so solutions by itself. You need the right architecture that interfaces your business environments and business processes with these technologies. You need a unique blueprint or architecture that allows you to plan for the next years of your transformation. Uh, in 2014, we have acquired Think Big to augment our uh, architecture expertise. And with that, I would like to welcome Ron Botkin, founder and president, Think Big, a Teradata company, onto the stage. Hi, Ron. How are you doing? Great, how are you? Good. It's great to be here. So, um, you know, what we wanted to talk a little bit about today around architecture is some exciting uh, news that we have put together an architecture team inside of Think Big that blends our years of experience. You know, we've been we started Think Big over six years ago to help companies uh, put together best in class architectures using open source technology, the Hadoop ecosystem, today a lot of Spark. But you know, what we realized is how important it is to blend that with the needs of customers who have commitment and tremendous success on the Teradata ecosystem and other existing technologies. And so by, we've put together this ecosystem architecture team that includes some of the best architects with Teradata and some of the best Hadoop architects that came out of Think Big to work together with customers to help them with understanding how do I decide what are the right workloads that I'm going to use? You know, how do I optimize my Teradata environment in an analytic ecosystem that includes Hadoop and Spark? And increasingly, a lot of our customers are asking, how do I think about the use of public cloud, right? How do I include an on-premise environment, a public cloud, maybe private cloud in a hybrid manner? So as an example, you know, our team is engaged with uh, a project for a large retailer that's really leveraging their Teradata estate as well as using a deep commitment to Hadoop to put together an innovative real-time environment where customer data can be used to drive decisions in the moment of interacting with the customer, whether it's in a digital environment or on, you know, in the environment of a store. So that, that project is underway. We are using a technology called Kylo, which is a data lake uh, environment that we put together at Think Big with years of, uh, from years of experience working with customers to manage the data inside the Hadoop environment, but then integrate it into what we're doing in, in their, um, into their database environment as well. So, so that's an example of putting together an architecture that leverages both of those the on-premise and the cloud, uh, or actually the, the on-premise data warehouse and, and the uh, Hadoop environment. Now, but the other thing I know is real important is cloud, right? So yep. when we work with customers around cloud, um, you know, we have a lot of customers that will start in the cloud, actually. You know, many of our customers initially deployed big data in the cloud, but realized that that was great for agility and getting started. Like one of our uh, biggest customers is a high-tech manufacturer that were able to consolidate a lot of data together using both Hadoop and uh, database in the cloud. Um, and now, as their environment's maturing, uh, realizing there's a tremendous opportunity to actually add a hybrid component to take some of that baseline workload um, that they're using to improve yield in their manufacturing processes and move it into a uh, on-premise environment that complements their innovation in cloud. Uh, Ron, thank you for the overview. Uh, there's maybe two more questions that I have that I'd like to discuss with you. Obviously, open source is playing a bigger and bigger role in architecture. Where do you see this going? Yeah, so you know, I think open source is driving a lot of innovation, right? A lot of our customers love the pace at which new ideas are coming out in open source. Um, but we, you know, we see that the open source innovation is really um, complementing the high quality commercial software in most of our customers, right? That they're interested in ultimately business results and they see a lot of value in blending that. And, and especially as you move to the cloud, 
what we're also seeing is that there's a lot of cases where customers are ultimately interested in how can I have a high quality service, you know, whether I have microservices or you know, more macro services that I can leverage to get the, the analytics value in my organization. Yeah. yeah, and as you said, and I think as, as Todd also referenced before, we've become a quite um, uh, engaged open source player ourselves. Your teams has taken the lead to, to work with a lot of open source. We have other teams that have now open source technologies like Covalent, our UI platform, like other things. We are working on Presto, open source, right? It's really an important component of our architecture. Uh, a second question and last question that I have for you is, um, why are architectures so often based on cost and technology capabilities rather than on business outcomes? Yeah, well, it, that's a really important question, right? And I think a lot of times organizations have focused only on the technology layer and think about cost optimization. How do I do more with less? And you know, what we're seeing is architectures that support the business, that support innovation, are incredibly important, right? When you talked earlier about digitalization, right, in this new digital world, it's really critical that companies form those close partnerships between technology teams and business teams and realize that the technology architectures are serving a business purpose. A very quick example, and that high-tech manufacturer we've been working with, you know, the C-suite of that organization came together realizing that they couldn't continue to have islands of data marts everywhere and no coordination. They couldn't have the data anarchy. We put together an integrated environment and it's made a stunning difference to their quality and their time to market that has really transformed their position in the industry. Great. Ron, thank you so much. Thank you, Oliver. Thanks for having you here. So, analytical competitors need analytics on top of data to unleash the potential of great companies. We need the strengths in all three areas. Technology solutions, architectural expertise, and business solutions. On Wednesday, we'll be back here on stage to talk about business solutions. The goal here is not to build a product. It's to impact people, process, and technologies. With that, I want to get back to the experiment that we have run earlier. Uh, where we asked you which of the following business outcomes is your company's highest priority. Let's look at the results here. Customer experience, by far the clear winner here. 62% say customer experience is the highest uh, uh, priority. It is really, really important, right? It is all about the customer. It's all about the customer journey in our companies. It's understanding where customers are, how we can interact with them better, how we can apply uh, our services and products to make our customers uh, uh, interact better with us. Really great. Thank you so much. Um, now, to close this out, I really want to talk about Again, the three things that we highlighted here today. Uh, it's about business solutions, and Teradata is focusing on business solutions. As I said, on Wednesday, we'll give you some examples here. It's about architecture expertise that we are providing in open source as well as in traditional technologies, and ultimately, technology solutions that allow us to implement these capabilities at scale. And this is an important part, at scale, Teradata has always been doing things for you, our customers, who have millions of customers, billions of tra uh, transactions, and now trillions of sensor readings. Thank you so much, uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing you again here on Wednesday.